o'clock, so we will get started, and I appreciate you being here tonight and for our last session uh, for the spring and our consideration of uh, the doctrine of the Word of God. Um, I think the uh, in the fall, God willing, we will reconvene and we'll begin talking about the doctrines of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. I don't think we'll finish that in the fall, but that's next on the agenda, which would be a, a fascinating study, I think, in its, in, its, uh, in its own right. Perhaps you've noticed, I hope you've noticed, uh, during the time you've worshipped at Christ Church, that there is a window in the middle of our sanctuary, the middle window of the group of stained, uh, five stained glass windows, is the Sola Scriptura window. And that's from, of course, the Latin phrase, <coughs> Sola Scriptura, for Scripture alone. And that phrase is meant to remind us and everyone who worships at Christ Church that the inerrant Word of God, the Bible, is the sole source of divine revelation, written divine revelation. That we believe that Scripture alone and its teachings can bind the consciences of people, and thus it is the standard by which all Christian belief and behavior must be measured. Not any human document, not any doctrine of faith, not any catechism, not any creed, but the Bible itself. Sola Scriptura, then... Uh, is a handy slogan which was coined by the reformers in the 16th century to reflect our commitment to the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture. And that is our topic for this, this evening, the sufficiency uh, of Scripture. But let us pray before we get into that. <laughs> Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Now, at this point in our study, it is a fair question to ask whether we should expect any additional words from God to be added to what we have in the 66 books of the Bible. Can we expect that to happen? And you might say, well, no, of course not. But there are many, many people in history who would beg to differ with that. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are some people who would say that additions to Scripture are absolutely necessary. Not only should we expect them, but they are necessary. <laughs> For example, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, held that after the death of the apostles, Christianity had fallen into complete apostasy. It was a sham of its former self. And so he thought that a restoration to the true faith was absolutely necessary. Not needed, but necessary. And to that end, in 1823, he claimed to have been contacted by an angel. And the angel's name was Moroni, <laughs> uh, who revealed that there were golden plates at a certain location, buried in the ground at a certain location near Palmyra, New York. And on those golden plates, the angel told him, was a history of an ancient man named Mormon and his fabled ancient Hebrew tribe that took his name. Now, these plates, these golden plates, were said to be a new revelation of Jesus Christ, another witness to the truth of the Christian gospel. Now, it is recorded in Mormon historical documents that the angel 
provided Smith with special spectacles. Uh, truly, it's what it says. Special spectacles that were needed to help him translate these writings from the golden plates. And that translation, made with the super spectacles, became what we know today as the Book of Mormon. And every time you see a, a Mormon missionary, they're trying to give you a Book of Mormon. If they're selling a Bible, they're going to sell the Book of Mormon alongside of it. Because members of the Latter-day Saints are taught to revere as an <coughs> equal authority, if not greater authority, since it's a new revelation of Jesus Christ that is supposedly contained in the Book of Mormon, they think it has more authority than the Bible itself. It's not that they don't revere the Bible, but the Book of Mormon, different thing. New Revelation tells us how Christianity should really be. So the Mormons would say, yeah, we need more than the 66, and we have it in, in the Book of Mormon. To take another example, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Pope is infallible when he speaks from his position of authority on a particular issue or doctrine of the day. And there's a special Latin term for that, when he is speaking ex cathedra. Literally it means from the chair. And you've seen the wonderful papal chairs, right? You've seen that ornate chair. And when he, Todd would have it, you see our new chair, he would have us have a papal chair if I didn't pull the strings on some of that. But anyway, he loves that very much. But uh, the papal chair, if, when the Pope speaks from that officially, ex cathedra, what he says uh, is, in, in terms of moral issues or doctrinal issues, is said to be infallible. Now that is not to say that everything, Roman Catholics do not believe that everything the Pope says is infallible. But when he's in the chair, and the few times in history where he's spoken to a doctrine or to a moral issue, no, what he says is of equal authority with Scripture. There's another word for that, sometimes you'll see it in uh, uh, newspaper articles, magisterium. The magisterium is the Roman Catholic Church's teaching authority. Uh, and so when he is speaking from that, he is said to be infallible. To give you an example of one of uh, the infallible pronouncements from one of the popes, speaking ex cathedra that has ramifications today, in 1854, Pope Pius IX proclaimed that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was herself conceived without the stain of original sin. So she was born sinless, unlike any other human being except Jesus Christ. What is the name of that doctrine? Do you know it? Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is wrong. But football players should know it. You remember when Franco Harris reached down? That was the Immaculate Reception, the Immaculate Conception is what, you know, they took that Franco Harris. By the way, Zach lives in Pittsburgh, and you go in the Pittsburgh airport, there's a lifestyle statue of O.J. I'm not O.J. saying no. He's probably running through the airport. No. Uh, uh, Franco Harris bending down to catch that pass. He's full, the guy's full. It's really pretty impressive. Uh, but that's the Immaculate Reception. But it comes from the Immaculate Conception, 1854, the Pope speaking ex cathedra said, no, Mary was without sin. She was born without sin, without the stain of original sin. Uh, now, that doctrine has absolutely zero basis in Scripture. Zero basis in Scripture. But for Roman Catholics, it is the Mother Church, the Magisterium, that is the final authority, not Scripture. The idea being that God, yes, continues to reveal new truth for the church through the infallible pronouncements of its popes. Now, they're just, they, they don't do that a lot, but when they do, they say, add that to the doctrinal thing, uh, corpus of the church. And as I said, those pronouncements, including the one in 1851 and five years later, the doctrine of the assumption, you know what that means, that is. <laughs> 
Still in the 1850s, 1850s was a big time for new doctrines in the Roman Catholic Church. But in the 1850s, the doctrine of the Assumption of Mary was that she was taken directly to heaven, that she did not die. That, okay, all right. Now, absolutely no basis for that in Scripture either. But so that's what I'm talking about. They, they deem those pronouncements equally authoritative with Scripture. All right, so that's the Mormons, the Roman Catholics. But how about this? I have been in charismatic churches, perhaps some of you have also, in which individuals stood up and purported to have a word from God. Have you ever heard that? I have a word from God. I have a message from God. Now, often that word is spoken in some heavenly language, and I put the air quotes around that for good reason, that then had to be interpreted by another person. Sh should be, anyway. My point here being, I'm not going to get into the tongues thing, my point here being that those pronouncements made in the worship service are heard by the congregation. They are accepted in those churches as new revelations, as a new word from God for the people of God, and as of equal authority with the Scripture. So you see what I mean when we say, well, can we expect anything to be added? Well, it depends on whom you ask. But for the Bible, the Bible itself speaks in terms of sola scriptura, of only <laughs> one abiding, tangible, infallible guide left by God for His church, and that is what we've been talking about for six weeks. The written Word of God. The 66 books of the biblical canon. And which doctrine the sufficiency of Scripture holds to be this. We believe that it contains all the words of God that He intended His people to have at each stage of redemptive history. Now mark what I say there. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. All the words God intended His people to have at each stage of redemptive history and we believe also that it now contains all the words of God needed for salvation, for trusting God perfectly, and for obeying Him perfectly. My friends, no matter what any man or woman or church body uh, would tell us to the contrary, it is clear that God Himself considers what He has told us in the Bible to be enough for us. Enough for us. And therefore that we should be content with what he has told us. The great revelation we have in scripture is wholly sufficient for us. And how do we know that? Well, we know it because the Bible itself teaches us this. I put the word salvation is in red here because I just said scripture now contains, we believe, all the words of God we need for salvation. Well, how do we know that? Well, Paul told us that. In 2 Timothy 3.15, speaking uh, to that young pastor, he speaks of the sufficiency of Scripture. And he says, the sacred writings are able to make you wise for what? For salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. If you want to know how to be saved, the Bible tells you that in no uncertain terms. Uh, Paul was not the only one to espouse that idea. Peter says much the same thing in his first epistle, chapter 1, verse 23. Peter reminds the redeemed Christians to whom he is writing there this. You have been born again, which is another word for say, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the agency, through the living and abiding word of God. All right, so we believe it is sufficient to teach us all we need to know about salvation. We also believe, the other words I put in red here now, trusting Him perfectly and obeying Him perfectly, because we believe that the Scriptures equip the saved to live the Christian life in, in exactly the way that God intended it to be lived. To, to equip us to trust God perfectly, to obey Him perfectly. And again, this is a point that Paul drives home in that third chapter of his second letter to Timothy. Let's read it again. All Scripture, he says, 
is breathed out by God <coughs> and is profitable, and look at the list, profitable for teaching doctrine, for reproof. When you go astray, it tells you where to get back into the straight and narrow, for correction, for training in righteousness, which is how to, <coughs> how to please God, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for what? Every good work. Now, what is left out of the word every? <laughs> every good work. Nothing, right? Mm -hmm. It is completely sufficient to teach us all we need to know about living the Christian life. So, my friends, let me ask you tonight. Do you want to know God's will for your life? Do you want to know how to please Him? And, and know that you're walking in His favor? And that you're pleasing Him perfectly? Then pick up the Bible. Pick up the Bible. Read it. <laughs> Study it, and by God's grace and in the power of the Spirit, then do all that it commands you to do. And if you do those things, you can be absolutely certain that you are living blamelessly before the Lord. And I use that word on purpose, blamelessly, because in the Bible's longest chapter, what's the Bible's longest chapter? This is a quiz. It might be on Jeopardy. What? <laughs> Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the Bible's longest chapter. Here's the first verse of it. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord, the law being God's commandments. Now, I want you to notice the equivalency here in this sentence. If, if you walk in the law of the Lord, you're what? Blameless. And if you're blameless, you walk in in the law of the Lord. That's an important verse, right? I, I cannot tell you how much great doctrine there is in the Psalms. Because some people ignore the Psalms and they read it as <coughs> nothing but poetry. Mm -mm. There is a ton of doctrine in the Psalms. And this first verse of the Bible's longest chapter is a case in point. So I want to ask you, what must we know? What was, must we do in addition to what God has revealed in, and commanded us in Scripture, to be perfect, as Jesus said, to be perfect even as our Heavenly Father is perfect. What do we need to know or what do we need to do besides this? What's in here? Nothing. Nothing. Right? Absolutely nothing. That is what the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture teaches in a nutshell. We sing this hymn all the time. It was written in 1891 by Lydie H. Edmonds. <laughs> she says, My faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. No, my heart is leaning on the Word, the written Word of of God. Do you know those words are actually in that hymn? It's what we've been talking about, the written word of God. So much great doctrine in our hymns. Right? Leaning on the written word of God. Now, you may be thinking at this point, and I don't blame you if you are, walking blamelessly before God. Let me think about that. <laughs> <laughs> The Bible has everything I need in it at walking blamelessly before God. Well, you may be thinking, that seems a high bar. And since sin does cling to us so easily in this life, and because you remember what Paul said, he frustratingly wrote in Romans 7 that those things I want to do, <laughs> those, those are the things I don't do, the things I know I shouldn't be doing, those are the things I find myself doing time and time again. Let us admit here in the parish hall of Christ Church <laughs> that in reality, we will never walk blamelessly before the Lord on this side of heaven. We will never be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. Now, that is in reality. Let me, I want to give a parenthesis here because of one, something one of my parishioners asked me this morning. They caught me on the way out and they had been to a recent funeral and in the obituary it spoke of the deceased as now standing sinless before God in heaven. What do you think about that? 
Do you believe that? Of course you do. How else could you stand before God in heaven except blameless? Sure. God is holy, right? He cannot, he cannot even count it as sin whatsoever. So she thought, there's no way a person is sinless. If you're talking about this life, that's right. If you're talking of in and of ourselves, that is correct. But what did that obituary mean? What's the doctrine behind what's written there? In whom are we perfect? In Jesus Christ. His righteousness covers us. So in God's eyes, we are sinless. We are blameless. And I want to make that point. That's in God's eyes. And once we're in heaven and our battle on this earth is done, that's all God sees us out is perfect. Our souls are made perfect the moment we go to heaven. Our bodies have to wait for the resurrection. But that, I want to make that caveat. So some people get confused about that. Uh, but you need to make sure what you're talking about in terms of the categories. But that said, in reality, in terms of this life, living this life, it is probably right to say none of us are ever going to walk perfectly before our Father in heaven. And so the reason I say that then is you might think, well, this doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture I can see its significance in theory. Uh, uh, I can see its importance in theory. But it's not very significant when it comes to our actual day-to-day -day Christian lives. I mean, what good is it to say that the Bible contains all the information we need to trust in God and obey God perfectly to walk blamelessly before Him if we have to admit that in reality, not going to happen. We can never obey its teachings perfectly in this life and therefore walk or live blamelessly before God. So, so really what's, what's the point? Well, that's what I want to talk about for a few moments. Because our human weakness notwithstanding, the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture is a very significant doctrine. And by the way, I've been in the church for my entire life. I don't believe I've ever heard a sermon series on the sufficiency of Scripture. I've heard some sermons on the Scripture, but we don't talk about this very much. We just seem to take it for granted without realizing that most of the world doesn't take it for granted. And we need to have a reason for the hope that is in us. So it's a very significant doctrine. And let me tell you why. For one reason, because it enables us to know where we can find all that God has said and revealed about a particular topic or question. It is complete in its revelation. So... Do you want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt how to be saved? Well, don't turn on the television. Lord, don't turn on the television. <laughs> don't read what your favorite author says about it, because they can be wrong. Go where? If you want to know how to be saved, go to the Scriptures. Do you want to be absolutely certain that you know what is going to happen to you when you die? I hope you want to know the answer to that question because unless Christ returns, we're all going to get to go on that journey. Well, the Bible clearly reveals the answers to those questions. Do you want to know all God has said about worship or prayer? You can find your answers in the pages of Scripture. Do you want to know what God has said about the family, about the role of parents, or the responsibilities of children, or what he has said about marriage and divorce, or the relationship between Christians and the civil government, the answers you seek are all in the Bible, along with a host of answers to other questions. And that is why I say the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture is a very significant doctrine, because it gives us confidence that we need go only to one source for the answers to our questions. And I want you to think about the implications of what I have just said. That saves us from having to sift through all the writings, all the sermons, all the expressed opinions of Christian leaders throughout history. 
And then we still are left, even after we sifted through all of that, we have to decide which human opinion should take precedence. Because humans seldom agree. It saves us from having to find a counselor we trust to tell us what to think or to do about a circumstance or situation in our life. It even frees us from having to rely on our own subjective feelings and impressions about a matter, which is a very good thing since our subjective opinions are so often distorted by our own sinful pride and our predilection to see things the way we want to see, to believe the way we want to believe. But the Bible is not only complete, it is completely objective. It stands outside of us. It stands outside of our experience. And for that reason, it is the ultimate authority. And the knowledge that we have access to uh, such an objective authority, as I say again, gives us great confidence when dealing with any matter or question. Now, let me make this point, having said that. That is not to say that we should not consider what other Christians have said about a subject. Just like you, I go to my favorite authors and find out what they have said and thought about matters. And so do you, we all do that. And there is certainly uh, something good in that. Doesn't mean we shouldn't consider what other Christians have thought about an issue. Or that we should pay no attention to our own internal thoughts and impressions. Very often, when we're about ready to do something and our conscience says, wouldn't do that, well, we would be good to pay attention to that. Right? I'm not saying that. Uh, what it means is this, though. When all is said and done, what an all-wise God has said about a topic, a question, a subject, must supersede our own opinions, our own experience, or the opinions or the experience of anyone else. At the end of the day, this has to be the rule. And so, guess what? If our subjective impressions or the opinions of other human beings contradict the teaching of Scripture, who's right? Scripture, Scripture must be the final arbiter of what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. That, it has to be that way. Now, I don't want to mislead you either. It's not as easy as it sounds. Because in order to come to a biblically informed conclusion about a matter, will often take some work on our part. Have you heard that before? <laughs> it will take some work. It really will. Usually, and this is what we do. Oh, Lord, I'm feeling bad today. I need some help. Let me open this. <laughs> Blind. <laughs> There's God's word for me today. That seldom works. That seldom works. Usually, we can't just turn to one scripture or one passage and get a definitive answer to our questions particularly if our questions are more complex in nature. But this is what I want to say. If we search Scripture carefully and prayerfully, because we remember we said earlier, without the Holy Spirit's guidance, this is a closed book. Carefully and prayerfully. And if we are diligent to discover and consider all that the Bible has to say about a particular matter or subject, we can then be confident that we know everything that God has said about it and thus confident to make wise, bold, courageous, godly decisions concerning it. But it, but it might well take some work. It will take some work on most issues. We have to dig, we have to study, and we have to compare and contrast what the Bible has said in different places. And I would like to point out that our acceptance of an adherence to the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture, well, it's what sets churches like ours and, and the churches that I grew up in, and most of you, or many of you anyway, it's what sets our churches apart from others. 
at the end of the day, it's though we have matters we might agree to disagree about. It's not baptism. It's not Lord's Supper. It's not those things which separate Christians. What separates Christians is this doctrine. What do we believe about the Word of God? What do we believe about its sufficiency? Certainly it sets evangelical Christians apart from others. For example, as we've already said, we differ greatly from the Roman Catholic Church at this point. Why? Because they would say that we have not discovered all that God has said or says about a particular question or subject until we have heard the official teaching of the church concerning it. So if you went to a devout Roman Catholic and said, well, here it says, I don't read this about Mary being sinless. <laughs> In fact, I hear her talking about God's mercy and grace. They would say, well, but that's not all that you need to consider. No, in 1854, speaking from the chair, Pope Pius said she was born without sin, so that's the law, right? That, that's called a completely different standard. And so you don't know who you're talking to. You beat your head against the wall talking to a Roman Catholic. I've, I've told you before, if you get into a discussion with anyone about any moral or ethical issue concerning how, uh, to which the Scripture speaks, first, 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 start with this question. Tell me what you believe about the Bible. Because if they do not believe that it's the final authority, then anything goes. You're wasting your time. You will never convince them. So that sets us apart. Is what we believe about this book. What do they, what do they call this? People of the book. <laughs> Evangelical Christians of all stripes have been called people of the book. Or Bible thumpers or anything else pejorative they can come up with. But the, the issue is... We believe that it's authority in our lives. That still sets us apart. But we also differ at this point from non-evangelical Christians. And what do I mean by that? Well, there are Christians, we would call them liberal theologians, who are not convinced. I guarantee you ran into some at the seminary. <laughs> who are not convinced that the Bible is in any way the uniquely authoritative Word of God. They just do not believe it. They don't teach it. Many of you have sat under preachers <coughs> most of your life who fall into this category I'm just talking about. They might not preach that from the pulpit, but that's what they believe. Right? And that's what they have been taught. They consider this book ancient literature. Maybe wonderful literature, but they believe it to be written by fallible men. And thus they would not even try to search the scriptures <laughs> to discover what God has said about a matter so much as when deciding how to live the Christian life or answer their theological questions, they would want to consider what other Christians have thought about those questions. They would want to do a survey of church history and find what the, particularly the early church fathers thought about a particular issue. Or they would want to consult what other Christians have experienced in their relationship to God in terms of a particular question or subject. And so in that way, you see, they would collect a variety of opinions, like a scientist, and viewpoints which they would then consider to be all potentially valid viewpoints for Christians to hold today. For instance, you may end up in a church where they say, well, every believer can interpret doctrines for themselves. And whatever they believe is right for them. Have you heard people say similar things to that? Well, that's completely different than what we're talking about tonight. The doctrine of the sufficiency uh, of Scripture. Uh, but, because for us, I should say, for evangelical Christians, uh, we should not expect any other additions to be added to the biblical canon. We have what we need. So, that's what we began with, right? Should we expect any more words to be added to the 66 uh, books of the Bible 
And the answer to that question is, from our perspective, is no. The doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture would have us understand and accept that what God has said to us in the Bible is enough for us and that we should be content with it. But I want to add a couple of important points under this heading. First, I want to make sure that we understand that the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture should not be thought in any way as implying that God cannot add any more words to those He has already spoken. So it's not like God is getting ready to speak and we say, Nope! Can't do it! Thank you! You said all you got to say. Yeah, that's it. It's over. No, no. This is God we're speaking of. So it is not, this doctrine does not teach that we cannot, God cannot, add words to what He has said. Uh, what I want to point out, however, is that the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture most certainly applies that man of his own initiative cannot add his own words to those God has already spoken. And at the end of the day, that's what the Roman Catholics do when the Pope adds doctrines that aren't in the Bible, or that are contrary to the Bible. That's what Joseph Smith taught in Mormonism is going on in the revelation of those golden plates. So that's adding man's words to what God has already spoken. The doctrine that we're talking about tonight means that we can rest content that in the fact that what we have in the Bible is all that we need, that it is wholly sufficient, and as we said earlier, throughout redemptive history, God has revealed all He wanted His people to know at any given stage of that history. And I want to sort of help you understand what I mean by that. For example, in the time of Moses, uh, we read this in the book of Deuteronomy 29, uh, uh, chapter 29, verse 29. Moses says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So this law refers here not just to Deuteronomy, as I've said before, but to the entire Pentateuch, the first five books of our Bibles. And thus at the time of the death of Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament were sufficient, right? For that point in, in salvation history, they were sufficient for the needs of God's people at that point. And that's the reason that Moses could write this in Deuteronomy 12, 32. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it. You shall not take from it. Those five books were sufficient. What the people had at that time was enough for them. But as we talked about earlier, in earlier sessions in this study, God later added words to the Old Testament Scripture. In fact, up until, remember we said the year 435 B.C. and the writings of Malachi. And with the addition of these last historical books of the Old Testament, and the prophecy of Malachi, God had said then, at the end of the Old Testament period, all that he wanted to say. Uh, and so he stopped speaking then for 400 years. There was a period of silence. Finally, though, with the advent of Christ, a new period opened in redemptive history. And guess what? God spoke again. And he added what we know as the New Testament to his revelation. But then, after the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, speaking of our emphasis today, the sending of the Holy Spirit, the founding of the early church, uh, and the assembling of the books of the New Testament canon, no further redemptive acts of God in history have occurred. Have they? No. Christ work was finished. And thus no further words of God have given, uh, have, we've not been given any further words to record in the Bible. So, 
That's why we say in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have all that God intends for us to have at this stage in redemptive history. But having said that, I want to reemphasize that it is not that God cannot add words to Scripture. Clearly from time to time in history, He has. Rather, the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture would have us understand that at each period in redemptive history, what God has said is sufficient for His people at the time in which they're living. Therefore, we should acknowledge that what we have now in the Bible is sufficient for the time in which we are living and in which we will be living until the second advent of Jesus Christ, which event will mark the culmination of redemptive history. And so we can expect that God will not be adding any further words to his New Testament revelation. It is complete. As we said a few weeks ago, the canon is closed. And thus, it's not an accident that just as Moses cautioned the ancient Israelites uh, not to add to or take away from God's revelation, guess what? The New Testament ends with exactly the same warning. We read this a few weeks ago, Revelation 22. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, and by book, not only Revelation, but this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. So, this is enough for us. We need to be content with it. <laughs> Unless we want to fool around with Revelation chapter 22. And there's some pretty awful plagues in that book that could be added to you uh, if you uh, have a mind to add or take away from God's Word. Well, I want to end our discussion of this doctrine and, and the doctrine of the Word of God more generally by pointing out that the sufficiency of Scripture is not only a significant doctrine, but it is a very practical doctrine. And that in at least five ways I want to, to highlight. And, and I hope that that's one of the things I can convey to you in all of these studies. We tend to think of doctrine as sort of dry and academic and boring, but actually they are also very, very, very practical. Uh, it's almost impossible to live the Christian life apart from living it in light of particular doctrines. So I want to point out some practical implications of what we've talked about tonight. First, the sufficiency of Scripture reminds us that we are to add nothing to Scripture. And what that means by implication is, is that we are to consider no other writings of equal authority, are value to Scripture. Let me say that again. We are not to consider any other writings of equal value or authority to Scripture. And that is so easy to violate. Now we say, oh, no, the Bible, the Bible. And then we go off and we have a question, we read our favorite author, right? You know, if you're a fan of, what, you name the great Christian theologians, they run to them and see what they said about it. Nothing wrong with that, but what if what they said about it doesn't really line up with Scripture? That's the point. It's so easy to, about, uh, to uh, violate this. It is worth noting, I think, here, almost all cults, all cults, violate this principle in one way or another. We mentioned the Book of Mormon earlier, right? Which I believe is a cult. It's certainly not Christianity. Uh, they violate this principle by adding what? The Book of Mormon to the Revelation and considering it of equal authority. But they're not alone in that. How about the Jehovah's Witnesses? You ever been knocking on their, your, your door with their watchtower literature? What do they believe about watchtower literature? That it's as equal authority with Scripture. It's a new revelation. What about Christian scientists? 
You know, they hold the book Science and Health with the Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy on a par with or even above the Scriptures in authority. And if you ever, ever talk to a Christian scientist, you know that. What is more, even some churches, Christian churches, tend to invest at least as much authority in their catechisms and confessions as they do the Scriptures. Do you know I've even been in some worship services where they actually read from the catechism or from the confession of faith in the service, in the worship service? Nothing wrong with reading from this. And I know that they would say, well, it reflects the teaching of Scripture. But what happens when you read a text of Scripture in the same worship service that you read from the catechism or the confession? What do people begin to do? Quite them. Right? They begin to see one as authoritative as the other, and that's dangerous. Because catechisms and confessions, no matter how brilliant they are, can be wrong on certain points. And we should never put the writings of human beings on an equal footing with Scripture. And if you stand up in a worship service and read aloud from the confession of faith, at that point you have made that doctrine uh, as, as important as the Word of God. Uh, by the way, that's different than the creeds. That's just a statement of general belief that is taken from the scriptures. But a catechism or a confession is an explanation of doctrine. And, and I, I, don't, I don't think those people mean anything wrong by that. But you see the danger that can be. I'm just saying there's a danger that people can begin to equate the two or to see one as as valid as the other. Um, still other Christians, especially in the charismatic movement. We talked about this earlier. They place their personal subjective feelings or revelations on a par with, with Scripture. Again, I, I've heard them myself in worship service. Well, the Lord told me, the Lord revealed this to me. And they want you to believe that that's as authoritative as the Scriptures. So given our predilection to add our own thoughts to what we have in Scripture... The doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture serves as a helpful and I think practical reminder uh, that we must ever guard against considering any other writing, any other revelation to be equal in authority to the Scripture. Rather, we should be content with what God has told us and we should judge everything else by the measure of Scripture. So that's one practical implication. It's a good thing to be reminded of. Secondly, and relatedly, the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture reminds us that God does not require us to believe anything about Himself or His redemptive work that is not found in Scripture. Let me say that again. God has not required us to believe anything about Himself or about his redemptive work that is not found in Scripture. Now, when we were discussing the canon of Scripture a few weeks back, we noted that at the time of the early church, there existed a collection, uh, or several collections actually, of alleged sayings of Jesus that some thought should be included in our Bibles. Do you remember that discussion they were having? And we said for good reason they were not ultimately preserved in our Gospels. But you know what? No doubt, no doubt, some, certainly not all, but some of those writings probably <coughs> do contain actual <coughs> sayings of Jesus. Are we to believe that he lived 33 years on this earth and all he said are the red letters we have in our Bibles? I don't think so. So there's no doubt that some of those documents probably contain authentic sayings of Jesus. But it is now quite impossible for us to determine which of those sayings are authentic and which are spurious. And so it doesn't matter, really matter, though, which. Because in terms of our salvation, in terms of living out our faith, as we said earlier tonight, it doesn't really matter what we think about those sayings or other writings. Or it doesn't even matter that we ever read them at all. For the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture assures us that God has caused everything we need to know about Jesus' words and His deeds to be recorded in Scripture. What we have in Scripture is wholly sufficient to teach us everything we should believe about the life and teachings of Jesus Christ and in formulating our doctrinal and ethical 
convictions as his disciples. A third point I want to make, and speaking of formulating our doctrinal and ethical convictions, it follows from what I've just said that the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture should encourage us to go to Scripture to discover what we should think about any particular doctrine or what we should do in any particular situation. Again, we, we intimated this earlier. We should be encouraged to know that in the Bible, God has told us everything He wants to tell us about such matters. <coughs> now, let me say this. That is not to say that the Bible will answer every single question we can possibly conjure up. <laughs> right? uh, or that there will not be some issues or questions about which God does not speak directly in the Bible. Because there are. In such cases, we may conclude, in fact we must conclude, if God doesn't speak about it at all, or if He speaks indirectly, uh, we may conclude either that God has not required us to think or act in any particular way concerning those matters, or that the proper answer must be inferred from Scriptures which might speak indirectly to those situations or questions. Let me give you an example of that. Nowhere in Scripture does God speak directly to the issue of consenting men and women living together outside of marriage? Go look it up. Not going to find it. Huh? By the way, why wouldn't it speak to that? In that culture, it couldn't have happened. <laughs> you know, they would have been stoned to death <laughs> by sundown. But that's a different time and a matter. But it does not speak directly to the issue of consenting men and women living together outside of marriage. And I happen to know this from having counseled people in my life once or twice. I happen to know that some people will say, well, see, God doesn't speak directly to that. It must be okay. We love each other after all. We're committed to each other, which, of course, you're not, or you would be married. But, uh, you know, uh, it, that, that's the thing. So that's the way we try to get around that. However... If we go to the Scriptures and search diligently, what will we find about that question? We will find that over and over, God prohibits fornication. That's the old word for that. What does that mean? It simply means He prohibits sex between adults or anyone else outside the confines of biblical marriage. That's what that is. Any kind of that. He prohibits that in both testaments. It's pretty clear. Uh, and he does tell Christians something else, doesn't he? He tells Christians to avoid even the appearance of evil. Even the appearance of evil. So some people will may say, well, wait a minute, you're just assuming that that's what we're doing. We're living together, that's true, but it's, it's an economic arrangement. And it benefits us that way. And, and you're just assuming that we're doing something immoral, if that's what you want to call it. And that says more about your judgmental attitude than it does about what we're doing. So it'll turn it around on you, right? But the Bible says you shall not uh, fornicate. So, okay, if you're not doing that, it also says you shall not give the appearance of evil. So if a man and woman are living together, they're not married, but they're living together what do people think is going on, right? <laughs> right? That they're just there because of an economic? Probably not, right? That was the whole premise of Three's Company, which I love that show. <laughs> what did they think was going on there, right? That was the whole funny part of that show. And that's what, so we do get some pretty clear advice, don't we? And so if you consider all of that, don't you think the answer to that question then is pretty clear? It's indirect, but it's clear. You shall not have sexual relations outside of marriage. And if you're a Christian, you shouldn't even give the appearance to the outside world that you're doing that. With both of those strictures in place, what's the answer? Pretty obvious, right? It's pretty obvious. But, and, that's, and I just give that. There are many, 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 many examples you can pick up that the Bible doesn't speak directly to it. But if you really want to read the Bible and take what it says seriously... It can't really answer your question in a fairly clear way. And by the way, 
The more we study our Bibles, the more adept we get at applying its teachings to all of life. As I said earlier, it takes some work. Again, you can't go to the concordance and say, living together, living together. <laughs> not there. <laughs> Let me go to my subject index, living together. Not there. Must not speak to it? Okay, it's okay. No, you may have to look and work a little harder at that, but the answers you seek are there. And by the way, sometimes we don't like those answers. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying sometimes we don't like them. They're inconvenient. They irritate us. They grate at us. But that's why the Bible is called, it calls itself sharper than two-edged sword, right? It cuts both ways. Uh, and that's true of all of us. Sometimes I go to the Bible for my answers and say, I don't really like that answer. And I try to turn over to the first Maccabees and it's not there either. <laughs> A fourth point is this. Speaking of living the Christian life, the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture reminds us, and boy, I, want to, I do want to emphasize this, nothing is sin that is not forbidden by Scripture either explicitly or by implication. Nothing is sin that is not forbidden by Scripture explicitly or by implication. And therefore, we are not to add prohibitions to those already explicitly stated, taught, or to those implied in Scripture. And there are many applications of this. I like to joke that growing up in the South and the Southern Baptist Church, it wasn't stated exactly this way, but... The implication was, is speaking of sex outside of marriage, you couldn't have sex outside of marriage because it led to dancing, <laughs> which, which, was, which was sometimes put forward as even a greater evil than the, you know what I'm saying? That prohibition, they just added that to it. And, uh, you know, uh, that's what I mean. We're very good at doing that. We're very good at making up rules that are nowhere to be found in, in Scripture. Let me give you one example, though, that I think illustrates the point perhaps better than that joke. Uh, there are some Christians and some Christian groups who state emphatically that it is a sin to consume alcohol of any kind at any time. Have you ever ran into those Christians? They're absolutely convinced of it. Now... To be sure, let me, let me say this. The Bible does teach emphatically that it is a sin to be under the influence of alcohol or any other foreign substance to the extent that that substance controls us, determines our thinking, influences our thoughts and behaviors. But nowhere does the Bible state or imply that consuming alcohol is itself a sin. Now, I'm sorry, that's just the fact of the matter. In fact, it's just the opposite. What did Jesus turn that water into? And I have heard some tortured explanations of that while I, was, while I was being told never to dance. I was also being told, now listen, you can't drink that because, oh yes, but it says wine, but it's not that. It was well juice. <laughs> no, it was grape juice. It was unfermented, which is just ridiculous. In the days without fermenting, uh, or, I mean, that just refrigeration, that was just impossible. Try to get, just leave your grape juice out for a couple of days on your counter and see what happens. Uh, so, without refrigeration. There's some tortured explanations of that. But Jesus turned water into wine. Paul reminded Timothy to give up drinking only water. Do you remember he told him to drink wine because it might be good for his digestion? And by the way, we're learning now today that there is medical validity to that. It's just that there's some truth in that. As my doctor told me, that doesn't mean five glasses before bedtime. But there is some good in it. That is not to say, however, I want to say this. And I don't want to make light of this for a couple of reasons. There are some situations in which a Christian absolutely should forego consuming alcohol for a greater principle. For instance, 
If one knows that one is in the company of a recovering alcoholic, and you're at dinner with them, if one loves that person as one loves oneself, one will most likely abstain from drinking alcohol so as what? Not to tempt such a person to fall back into a destructive habit. The, 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 the principle of love is more important than the glass of wine at that point. Similarly, if one is in the company of a Christian brother or sister whom one knows to be absolutely convinced that it is sinful to drink or consume alcohol, then Christian charity would again demand that one abstain so as not to wound what Paul calls the weaker conscience of his brother or sister. So you don't want to give them cause for stumbling at that point. But though there may be such times, and such situations in which it would indeed be wrong, or sinful even, to consume alcohol. Absent some specific teaching to that effect, though, it would be equally wrong to mandate abstinence for all believers at all times. You see, that's going too far. It's going beyond what the Scriptures teach, explicitly and by implication. Such a prohibition... Blanket prohibition would be to add man-made laws to what Scripture commands. And, and after all, do you remember Jesus condemning the Pharisees for exactly this principle? For adding laws upon laws upon laws on the backs of the people that were nowhere to be found in Scripture. So we have to be more thoughtful about such matters. But the principle remains. Nothing is sin that is not forbidden by Scripture, either explicitly or by implication. And there, there are a lot of things that fall under this category. On the other hand, and this is the last thing I will say, the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture reminds us also that nothing is required of us by God that is not commanded in Scripture, either explicitly or by implication. And this should encourage us to go to Scripture to discover God's will for our lives. I, I'm sure that all of us at some point have asked, what is God's will for my life? Maybe generally, maybe in this specific situation. What would He have me do uh, under these circumstances? The problem is, when we have those kinds of questions, most of us go everywhere and anywhere but the Bible to try to find our answers. We seek guidance for changed circumstances. Lord, just get me out of this circumstance. Or we ask God just to change our feelings about a certain matter. Sometimes we seek direct guidance from the Holy Spirit apart from the Scripture. In other words, Holy Spirit just, I won't even think about it, you just leave me where you want me to go. I'm just on autopilot right, at that point. Sometimes we go to other people to try to learn God's will for our lives through their counsel. And which brings me to something else I want to say under this particular heading. If someone tells us that they claim to have a word or a message from God telling us what we ought to do, we have absolutely no obligation to obey such a message unless it can be confirmed by the application of Scripture to our specific situation. I love listening to the great English preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Any of you listen to Martin Lloyd-Jones? This is marvelous. Marvelous. Uh, he's been gone since 1981. But he has a sermon in which he tells of a man he was pastor at Westminster Chapel in London for many years. By the way, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was not a doctor of theology. He, was, he had risen, he was a medical doctor, and he had risen to the point where he was the royal physician. He served the royal family. That's pretty high cotton in England, as you may have been reminded a few, a few days ago. He gave it all up because he felt that God was calling him to the pulpit. And boy, do I say amen. <laughs> he was definitely calling you to the pulpit because he is magnificent. That's another story. He 
he is preaching a sermon, and he says a man came to him in his office at Westminster and uh, was just desperate. The man was just beside himself, wanting guidance. It seems that this man was a baker by profession, you know, uh, 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 the bread and that thing. Uh, and it seems that the baker had gone to a religious meeting in which the evangelist had told him that God had revealed to him, the evangelist, that this baker should become a minister. God is calling you to the ministry, the man said. Okay, maybe. Having tried desperately to obey this word from the Lord, the baker was simply miserable, miserable in the pursuit of his new calling. And so he went to Lloyd-Jones for his advice. And Lloyd-Jones said it was immediately obvious to him that this poor man had none of the gifts <laughs> required to be an effective minister. He hated to read. He hated to study. He, he didn't like to write. He was obviously not an eloquent man or even a nominally talented speaker. So Jones helped this poor man to understand from Scripture that God does not call us all to be ministers. And at any rate, what Joan said, God calls no one to any service that he does not also gift us for. He won't call you to something unless he gifts you with what you need to do. It. And so, Joan said he told the baker that he should go back to his former profession and live out his Christian life and witness as faithfully as he could through that ministry, through that calling. Now, that is wise counsel. And it, he said the man walked away and finally there was like a burden lifted off of his shoulders. And it underscores what we said earlier. We have absolutely no obligation to obey a message from God that cannot be confirmed by the application of Scripture to our lives and to our situations. And my friends, the realization that nothing is required of us by God that is not commanded in Scripture, either explicitly or by implication, is a thought that should bring great joy and relief to the lives of those many, many, many Christians who spend countless hours seeking God's will outside of Scripture. And they can never really be certain that they've ever found what they're looking for. But it doesn't have to be this way. Does it? The doctrine that we're talking about tonight, the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture should serve to convince us and to motivate us to begin eagerly seeking and finding God's will in Scripture and growing in holiness, knowledge, obedience, freedom, and yes, blessed peace, as that baker found out, as a consequence. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with going to someone and say, can you help me learn from Scripture? Can you help me see how to apply Scripture to this situation? I think that's commendable. And there's nothing wrong with that. But we have all we need in the pages of the Bible uh, to lead and guide our Christian lives. Do you have any questions or comments about this or any other matter we've covered over the six weeks? Randy, whatever happened to the golden plates that the Mormons talked about? I don't know what happened to them. <laughs> they're, not, they're not preserved anywhere. Okay. And probably they would tell you that they're not there because we've worked at them. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, the golden place. What I love are the golden, I mean, the special spectacles. What happened to those? Wouldn't you like to get a hold of a pair of those? Yeah. <laughs> and see, I wonder what prescription that is. Uh, yeah, that's some uh, interesting stuff when you read that. Any other, any other questions? Let us pray and we'll go home. Lord Jesus, we cannot thank you enough for the gift of the Holy Bible.
as we've heard recently, what a treasure it is. It is the word of life for us. Help us, Lord, to be diligent students of it as your disciples. Help us to look for our answers in its pages and to go to you in your word and in, in asking your spirit to guide us into all the truth for our good and for the good of your church and the growth of your kingdom. And we thank you again for this inestimable gift that you have given us. All praise and glory to you. Amen. Um.